This podcast includes graphic depictions of true crime cases and may contain explicit language. Listener discretion is advised. Hey, this is Robin. This is Jackie. And this is Amanda. And you are listening to We Saw the Devil, a podcast dedicated to horror, true crime, and all things macabre. If you want to follow us between shows, don't forget to check us out online. You can go to our website at www.wesawthedevil.com. You can follow us on Instagram at We Saw the Devil Podcast or on Twitter at We Saw the Devil. And if you want to follow specific co host social media, you can find the links to those on our website as well. Hello, everyone, and welcome to part three of our Joseph James D'Angelo series, where we have discussed the man who is known by many names, such as the Visalia Ransacker, the East Area Rapist, the original Night Stalker, the Golden State Killer, amongst other things. Cordova. You did it! (laughs) I've been practicing. (laughs) Yeah, so this is part three where we will be covering the Visalia Ransacker. So this is when he really started to get amped up. Before we get into all the good stuff, let's talk about our Patreon. Amanda? Well, thank you so much to our patrons. I love the conversations that we have in our Patreon-only group. Um, I just sent out the remaining uh, postcards for this month, too. For those that haven't received them yet, please continue to check your mail. I know some of you have even expressed that you don't check your mail until you know something's coming. So check (laughs) it. (laughs) I do the same thing. Mm -hmm. So it's totally fine. Um, So those are in the mail. Uh, For those newbies, your stickers are also in the mail for the ones that signed up for that tier. And then Robin, what's going on on the shirt front? Yeah, so we are going to start shipping all of our shirts out at the end of the month. Um, Based on the drop shipper that we have, that is when they print them. And so all t-shirts now will be going out towards the end of the month. Right. And because of the virus, everyone knows a ton of businesses are affected by it. So your shirt shipping times are a little bit longer than expected. Um, But just know we have order numbers for the ones that were ordered and we are in contact with the company that prints them. So just heads up on that. And I love the the pictures of what people are doing with like their stickers and postcards. Um, So hopefully we'll be able to fill out those postcards with a lot of different states in the near future. Agreed. We do plan to go through all 50. (laughs) <laughs> so hopefully there's not crazy amounts of crimes everywhere <laughs> but if there are we'll find them this is america <laughs> <God>. all righty <sighs> so yeah where we left off last time we had talked about kind of the evolution of what we believe happened with joseph james d'angelo and how he got started so we talked about early life we talked about the initial break-ins And then we kind of ended after he got married to Sharon. And we had also discussed that he worked for the Exeter Police Department at this time. So just for those joining us now, you can go back to the last two episodes in the series where we we started with kind of his evolution. Yes, And again, this is not a deep dive into Joseph James D'Angelo and his crimes. This is more of a broad overview. You could literally spend every day for the next five years studying this man. Uh Uh-huh. And every time I think I'm done with notes, I'll find another article and I'm like, oh, here's this person's view on it or here's this interview. And then it takes, you know, two hours to stop. Right, exactly. So Again, this is more just a broad overview. There is a show, and I mentioned it, I believe, in the, the previous two episodes, coming out on HBO um, based on the Michelle McNamara book called I'll Be Gone in the Dark. And it's just, I believe, there's very limited information about it, but it seems to be documentary style about him and his life. So this is kind of just an over broad overview and teaser of how awful this human being actually was. And it's really, really, really fascinating. So in any case, part one was his background, part two, was the Cordova and Cordova Meadows series of crimes. And then here we are at now Visalia. Now, it's important to note, as Amanda stated, that Joseph James D'Angelo was a police officer with the Exeter Police Department from 1973 to 1976. So as we discuss these crimes, know that he was, in fact, a police officer in Exeter. Now, Exeter, California, is just roughly 12 miles, roughly 15 minutes from Visalia. So Mm -hmm. he was, in fact, a police officer in a neighboring town during this crime series. Visalia is a very small farming community in California, and it's located between Fresno and Bakersfield off of Route 99. 
the person known as the Visalia Ransacker. Burglarized over 95 homes, but law enforcement actually estimates that it could be well over 150. And as of right now, he's known for committing one murder. So he was a busy, he was a busy gentleman, to say the least. I still can't understand how he accomplished all of this. And, you know, going back to our last episode, too. How does anyone have this much time to do all these heinous, horrible things? Well, the thing, too, and we'll get into that in this episode, is this is when the peeping began. Like, the mm-hmm. full-on stalking. Well, he did a little, some minor stalking when he, you know, it was wrapped up with the indecent, indecent exposure. <laughs> Remember the surrogate family. So, one of the sisters had mentioned that someone might have been in her window at one time, and now she thinks it could have potentially been him. So, it could have started very, very early, just, you know dumb kid no one really thinks too too i mean they they think it's bad obviously but like maybe he just got away with it and then this is (laughs) full-blown adult man this is hard this is hardcore now so also if you want to kind of follow along with this episode in different instances we've mentioned her before she's an absolutely incredible author her name is kat winters She's basically made it her life mission to study and write about this case up until even up until Joseph uh, James D'Angelo got caught. Uh, her website right. is actually visaliaransacker.com. So you can go to the, um, that website. It breaks it down by dates, MO. It has just a like, huge wealth of information there. So go there to see the, li- the list of confirmed and unconfirmed attacks. This area of California at this time in the mid-70s had a lot of crime. And Mm -hmm. there are still so many attacks that are somewhat similar in MO, but haven't been officially confirmed as Joseph James D'Angelo. So it's crazy, though. There's so much. Yeah. Um, Amanda, do you have anything else to add to that before we get into get into it? No, I don't think this. I mean, it just clearly shows like each crime spree or each piece of, you know, the different types of crime each time it gets increasingly worse. You know, he adds something more horrible to each set of crimes. So this is like, ends with murder, right? So, or I shouldn't say ends, but it, it includes a murder yeah. now. And before it didn't. So and then it's just going to get worse from here. So the Visalia Ransacker, the crime spree is estimated to have started in March of 1974 with a stolen piggy bank and ended at the in December of 1975 with, as you just said, a murder. There are a few crimes that happened in 1973, but there's not enough evidence to confirm that it was the Visalia Ransacker. They were actually still lumping that into either just random criminals or the Cordova cat burglar. During this time, between 1973 and 76, peeping Tom calls, like to the police, the peeping Tom calls went absolutely skyrocketed through the roof. People would call, they would see a man standing outside their bedroom window. Uh, Once, a couple was mid-sex, and they saw a man standing outside their bedroom masturbating and watching them. Oh, my gosh. Police would come to the scene and find a shoe print under the window, and that same shoe print would actually appear at dozens and dozens of other homes around the Visalia area, Mm -hmm. including crime scenes that the, the, the person had ransacked. And that'll come back later, too. Yes. The shoe prints. Exactly. Shoe prints are a big thing here. Right. And... There are a couple um, interviews, like old interviews that you can find of some of the police officers talking about how frequently they would get this call. They were all just completely just befuddled by it. Mm -hmm. There were so so many daily almost calls on peeping toms. So his MO, let's talk, let's start with his MO. So the the Visalia Ransacker would typically enter through a window or break in through a door. Once inside, he would create multiple exit points. And this is very specific to Joseph James D'Angelo. And one of the main items of his MO is that he would pull when he would enter through a home and then pull the window screen into the house in multiple rooms. Right. And he'd leave them in strange places sometimes. Yeah, he would leave them like, one in the kitchen or put one in the garage he would right i thought they'd find him too like on their beds and just it wouldn't be like right in front of the window you know that he took it off of and during this visalia ransacking spree he would ransack bedrooms and dump entire drawers on the floor he would continue to take again like the previous series in cordova he would take small items like a single earring wedding bands piggy banks random coins and collectibles and at one point and multiple times a guns Right. And for some reason, he'd leave like the bigger bills. It would just Uh be like the weird coins. So I I don't understand that. But okay. He would also he also loved food. (laughs) Well, he doesn't. 
<laughs> right? He would eat their food. He would take leftovers out of the refrigerator and pour them all over the ground or on the kitchen table or in the bedroom. Uh, he would take bottles of wine and pour red wine all over carpet. He also loved lingerie, women's lingerie. So what he would do there is he would go into the bedrooms and empty the drawers of women's underwear, bras, panties, so on and so forth. And then he would pour things on it. He would lay them out, like display them on the bed and then pour orange juice or wine all over them. Really weird. And he typically would not do anything to the men's underwear. This was specific (laughs) only to women. Right. And then at one point, I I can't say this was a verified source, but there was some reports that some of the underwear sometimes would be like turned inside out as if he like put them on. Uh What do you think about that? Did that happen? (sighs) I don't think that he put them on. They'd just be like perfectly, you know, like, I don't know. They just said it looked like someone had taken them off. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was very odd. But yeah, the men's underwear would never be disturbed. It was just the women's Perhaps one of the, the, the grosser parts of this is mm. law enforcement has stated that he was actually masturbating at some of the crime scenes because they would find Jurgen's brand lotion and he would bring it with him to the scene and then leave smears of it around the house and on doorknobs, like on purpose. Ugh. Yeah. I'm sure Jurgen's did not want that <laughs> out. That, that is not a sponsorship that Jurgen's would would authorize Mm -hmm. that's well no that's yucky yeah um could you imagine returning home (laughs) and finding all of that well this is a lost cause like (laughs) who wants this house yeah and he just that he'd return to certain homes too you know like once he struck and you're you think you're out of the the water like that didn't mean anything right no oh we'll get there we will get there Due to a lot of the shoe prints, like we said, they were incessant. So many people called, sometimes repeatedly at various homes, right? So a homeowner would find a shoe print outside of a window. And then a month or two later, you know, it would, they would cover it up or it would be gone. And then it would return. Mm-hmm. The Visalia Police Department believed that he had created sort of like a peeping route for himself. Right. Like he actually created like a schedule or a group of houses that he would repeatedly go to. He escalated beyond random break-ins, and he actually started at this time calling and harassing potential victims. So Mm -hmm. he would find a house or location home that he wanted to break into, and he would actually call them and harass them. Uh, Hang-ups, you know, calls and hang-ups, harassing them, calling them names. So that started happening in the Visalia Ransacker, which will definitely take hold and continue throughout his future crimes, too. Right. Luckily, today's age, that would be much harder. (laughs) Yes. I feel like so many of his crimes were committed just as a sign of the times. You know what I mean? And he would have been caught so much more quickly if we had Mm -hmm. scientific developments and and stuff. Right. And then now, you know, looking at it, like with all of the different things that we have learned how to do, Mm -hmm. knowing that still some people are able to get away with stuff. Mm -hmm. is terrifying. It's crazy. So... As we said earlier, there are like roughly up to 150 burglaries and break-ins, right? And we're not going to cover these individually because the vast majority of these are just him breaking into a home, trashing the shit out of it, uh, messing things around. Um, he would take one earring and then drop it down the down the street, much like the mm-hmm. same MO of the Cordova Cow Burglar, right? Right. So right. very much the exact same thing. So we're just going to touch on a couple highlights in his in, in this case. So right. So much of this was happening at this time that by the end of 1974, the Visalia Police Department set up multiple patrols and checkpoints because the attacks and peeping Tom calls were becoming so numerous. Right. They likely actually spoke to him and met him multiple times, but weren't able to catch him in the act or as as he was fleeing a scene. Right. Could he have been like, well, I'm a police officer, too. Yeah. Just trying to help out in this area. You Mm -hmm. know, like, how did he... Oh, I wonder what happened. You know, there's not something that we can. Well, there are multiple theories. And the police officer thing is one of them because he Mm -hmm. did have access to a radio in his car. And and if he was using his own vehicle, there are multiple reports of different vehicles in an area from eyewitnesses. But again, he was a police officer and had it and had access to the impound lot at the at the station. Right. Right. And who knows? He could have just waved his badge and they just, you know, waved him through. Right. Exactly. And no one, you know, having a second thought of it. 
Also, another thing that multiple people, especially Kat Winters, has brought up that 1974 was in the middle of the running craze. So people didn't just go for a leisurely jog, right? This actually started getting super big in 1974 as kind of a hobby. So many, many, many people were outside running through neighborhoods and going to trails and parks. So it is actually feasible in a residential neighborhood that he could have been, quote unquote, peeping or stalking or planning as he was, you know, going for a jog. So I feel like he didn't have the build for a jogger. That's true, too. Yeah. I just feel like if you saw him trying to jog that long, not that he was like super overweight or anything, he just didn't have that body type. Exactly. And this is further kind of proven by descriptions given by witnesses, because even though he was super careful while he was inside the homes, he was spotted by neighbors several times. And do you want to talk about his the descriptions that they gave? So there was a description, too, that police gave, and this was in the LA Times, as a round-faced man, heavy but agile enough to leap the fence with one hand. Police training, I'm guessing, mm-hmm. right? Like being able to jump walls and get out of situations or, you know, possibly chase potential prowlers, yeah. you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so he's pretty good at it. So another description of him would be white male, early 30s, late 20s, stocky, overweight, a little pudgy, with a pear-shaped body, average height, short brown hair, no facial hair, light skin, wide bone structure. So again, that doesn't say, you know, runner or jogger to me. No, they make him sound like a fatty. So yeah, and I don't think I don't think he was. I mean, he had to be, you know, if he's jumping walls and stuff, he had to be a little in shape there. So And it was reported by several people that he was, quote, talking to people who were not there. That's not concerning at all. (laughs) Was he pulling a vallow? Yeah, pulling a vallow. I guess dates to note. So on November 30th of 1974, he actually attacked, and by attacked, I mean burglarized, 11 times in one single day. Like, that's so much time. You know, like, he... Where did his wife think he was at this time? You know, like, I I try to think of the man himself as he's doing this. And he had a lot of obligations. He had a wife. He had a pretty, you know, intensive job. So it's just like, how did you satisfy all, all of these things at once? His wife probably wanted to see him at some point. Or did she? Because apparently per her Yelp reviews, they are not glowing. (laughs) Right. If you want to talk about that for a second, just she does not appear to be a very nice woman. And it could just be maybe in the business side of things. People don't get along with her well. Um, So I don't know how she is personally. She has some pretty sad Yelp reviews. Mm hmm. Sharon Huddle is her name. And if you want to kind of prepare for a future episode as well, Google her and look up her Yelp reviews. They are not good. (laughs) No, she just doesn't come across as very nice as, you know, as a um, business relationship, I should say. Again, we don't know her personally. We don't know how she was outside of work. That's true. 11 times in one day. So that is, per reports, the longest stretch of crimes in a single day from basically any perpetrator of that sort. Mm -hmm. So that's crazy. 11 different homes burglarized in one day. Right. Now, what's also interesting to note is that not a single Visalia ransacker crime was committed on a Tuesday. So is it possible that he had meetings or court or, you know, on those Tuesdays? Uh, Did he set Tuesdays up for preparation, peeping, stalking? We don't know, but not a single out of 150 likely crimes, 95 confirmed, probably up to 150, not a single one was committed on a Tuesday. Interesting. Moving on, let's talk about the murder. So this spree included Joseph James D'Angelo's first known murder, at least human right, of murder. a human. Mm-hmm. Yes, I will still stick up for those poor puppies. Yes, that was so sad. Professor Claude Snelling, a journalism professor at the College of Sequoias, was in fact his first human victim. Right, and just the, the account of that night is so sad, and just the lead up to it as well. The lead up to it is also crazy. So prior to his first act of actual human on human violence, up until this point, the Visalia ransacker had burglarized 84 homes, right? So this is the 85th attack in the VR. I'm going to start calling the Visalia ransacker VR. That is how um, people abbreviate his name. So we'll start calling him VR. Yes. This is the 85th VR attack in the series. This whole murder is just, you know, obviously horrible. 
And they almost felt, I, I saw in one interview, um, his daughter, her name is Beth in these stories. Um, I think she goes by Elizabeth nowadays, but Beth. And Beth said, like, they knew that there was this person, you know, breaking into homes, but not that they felt, I, I don't believe she used the word safe, but she didn't think anything terrible would happen. Let's say that they got into the house. Um, that was one interview I, I had found um, and yeah, the whole community is like, yeah, someone may break in, but at least, you know, no one's going to die. Yeah. But it it changed a little bit. So there is a very, very good interview, and it's from the LA Times. Um, they actually had a podcast on it as well called Man in the Window. Mm-hmm. And they have an interview with Beth Snelling, and she talks about that entire occurrence. So I did take a bit from that. She did say that... One night, um, so in February 1975, she heard something outside. And then her dad, like, rushed in out of breath and said someone was at her window when he got home. So he jumped out of the car and chased this man down the street. So, of course, imagine being her, like, oh, man, someone was in my window? Like, yeah. how scary that could be. So she's she says about six months later, she was watching TV in her bedroom with her boyfriend. And she was joking around with, like, saying, wouldn't it be weird or wouldn't it be scary if that guy was watching us right now? And she says, you know, she was kind of being playful. Um, When she got up, she was going to change the the TV channel because the TV was like right underneath the curtain. But instead, she flung open the curtain. And when she, you know, pulled the curtain apart, the man was standing right there. I would shit myself. (laughs) I would literally shit myself. That is terrifying you know like she was trying to just be silly and then oh my gosh no that's real that's happening to you again um so of course like her boyfriend got up and she screamed so you know the whole house was alerted and her boyfriend and dad ran outside after him and obviously did not catch him so she estimates about a month later and the date on the actual crime is september 11th 1975 Um, She claims that the air conditioner was out, so they left the windows open that night. Now, when she woke up, she woke up to someone on top of her saying, you're coming with me. Don't scream or I'll stab you to death. Now, it's also Uh, important to note, too, and that Beth Snelling did also uh, talk about this, mm -hmm. has talked about this multiple times in multiple interviews, the way that he spoke. So this will come into play very, very, very important piece in the East Area Rapist and um, Crimes. He talks through clenched teeth. So he partially growls and then speaks through clenched teeth. And we will actually Mm -hmm. play in the future episode some of the recordings that people have of him. But yeah, she just wanted to make a note there of when he said that it was through clenched teeth. Yes. Yeah. So he doesn't speak in his normal voice when he's doing all of this. Um, But he was wearing a ski mask. And um, so she said, you know, she woke up and there's this ski masked figure in front of her, you know, or on top of her. And he also did have a gun. So remember, he said or she says that he told her, I'll stab you to death. But also he had a gun. Right. So just so terrifying. So he ordered her to keep silent and started pulling her out of the house. And again, in this um, interview, it's also the narrator at times. And then it's Beth kind of adding to it. Mm -hmm. So from from what I get is she was trying to comply but as he pulled her past her brother's room, she kind of whimpered. I mean, imagine being dragged down, you know, the hallway, right? So when he was pulling her through the gate to the fence towards the street, that's when her dad came out and yelled. And he was coming through the kitchen. So what I imagine is like, you know, a back door possibly mm-hmm. kind of by a fence. And then he's coming through the kitchen is the way that I interpret that. Um, And she says that he was near like the kitchen counter and he let out almost like a a roar is how she described it. And that he was going into some sort of like warrior mode, which could you imagine like you're, you see this man manhandling your daughter, kidnapping her. Yeah. Literally kidnapping her. Yeah. So he, yeah. in all right. He, he was yelling warrior mode, like went after this intruder. Right. So that's when he stopped and he looked at Claude and he shoved Beth to the ground And then that's where he fired at Claude twice. So he hit him twice. Um, And that was with his gun. So he went down there, but then he got back up and ran through the house towards the front door. 
And what Beth says in the interview is she thinks that he was trying to head off the kidnapper before he could get to the street. Right. So even though he had just gotten shot twice, he's still trying to protect his family. And that that's just so incredibly sad. Mm-hmm. Um, but then when he got towards the front door, that's when he collapsed. So then um, VR turned to Beth again and pointed the gun at her and just her account of this, of just feeling like this is it. This is where, you know, it ends for me. So she said she had like her knees pulled up and her head down thinking she was going to be shot, which why wouldn't she Mm -hmm. like think that the way that he was pointing a gun at her. Um, But he then instead of shooting her, he kicked her in the face and in the head a couple times and then ran. Mm -hmm. So then, of course, you know, everyone in the family's up by this time. Uh, They call police. And when the ambulance arrived, her father was still alive at this time. But then later, that's when her mom, you know, came to her. And just the way she says this, she says, my mom told me daddy died. And it just, it's so sad. You know, this grown woman talking about this night and just, I don't know, just imagine having to tell your kid that. And, you you know, the first in the series of of a death when this guy, all the other houses he's tormented, he's gone through their stuff and did gross things, but like, this one ended in her father dying. Yeah. And he tried to save her. Can you imagine the level mm-hmm. of survivor's guilt that she probably feels? And yeah, you can't say, just don't feel like that, you know, but it, yeah, the dad, he was trying to protect his family. And I, I mean, in all accounts, he did though. Yeah. Because what if he would have taken her out? What would he have done to her? We don't know because this was all new. So there is an interview that I was able to find. Um, ABC seven did it. And it was right after he had gotten arrested and they talked to Beth now. Now she goes by Elizabeth Hupp and her pain is still very visible. So they talked to her after he was caught and said, yeah. yep, we're pretty confident we have the Vesalia Ransacker. And she says it all came flooding back like it was yesterday. And then towards the end, they talk about how her dad wasn't there for her wedding and the birth of her children. And that was taken away from her. And the damage is still very real. You know, these victims, even though we're saying this happened a long time ago, it it ruined their families. Mm-hmm. So even though, you know, 1975, 1974, 73, that seems so long ago, but these families are still feeling the pain from it. Yeah, no, they absolutely are. And, you know, with the Beth Snelling, you know, she lost her father. And then if you think, and you, you, there are all these interviews too on YouTube that you can watch with people of just whose homes he burglarized. Right. And initially your thought is, well, people can, can replace their shit, but not Mm -hmm. if it's from your mother who left her a ring, left you a ring, you know, and she's now gone and like family heirlooms. And, you know, he would break furniture. He would ruin things. I mean, the amount of actual victims that he had, whether it's murder or just sentimental victims, you know, I mean, they number in the thousands. Well, that and then just the feeling of not feeling safe in your own home. You know, if someone enters your home and you did not invite them in, that feeling is not just going to go away. Uh -uh. You're not going to feel safe ever. No, and I was watching a couple interviews too about um, both Visalia and then also Sacramento when EAR start appears and starts the the rape series and just mm-hmm. the level of terror that the people in these communities felt because you know it finally made the newspapers and was a huge deal and so many people were victimized and had you know had something perpetrated against them that you know it was a very very real fear at the time and it, you know comparing it to say like Son of Sam in New York City right like everyone was terrified and the same thing here happened in visalia and everyone was just absolutely terrified Mm -hmm. rightly so it it's horrible no absolutely yeah so as amanda mentioned so beth snelling in another interview talks about how for about the two weeks before the attack the final attack the murder of Mm -hmm. her father she felt as though that she was being followed or stalked and that was actually corroborated with the interview that she gave her p- police and is present in her police report. And police asked her, well, why do you think you're being followed or stalked? And she didn't know. Like, she didn't, she didn't know. She just said it was a feeling. So what I found really, really interesting is that psychologists have actually spoken on this, the feeling of being stalked. And so apparently it's a very actually real phenomenon. And it's where our brain, you know, we may not register that someone in particular is following us. So we may not know that someone in a car is slowly driving five cars behind us, or we may not register that someone's following behind us on a sidewalk. Our brain can subconsciously pick up on clues from our physical and social environment. 
she also knew that she had a prowler outside of her window, you know, at that point though, which probably also heightened her awareness of it. But I found it really interesting that she knew, she said that she had a feeling that she would meet him again. And unfortunately that is the truth. In terms of the VR, this is his first known human murder. Right. But how sure are police that the VR killed Claude Snelling? We'll talk about this at the end as well, um, about the post-arrest and as it relates to VR. But on August 31st of 1975, so a month before this, VR stole a gun during a burglary. And the owner of that gun had filed a police report and told investigators that they could find some of the old spent rounds that he had shot into a canal at a location nearby. Now, the police went to that canal and actually collected those rounds. So ballistics were tested against the ballistics from that burglary. And then Mm -hmm. also the gun used to kill Claude Snelling, and they were a match. So the Visalia Ransacker was, in fact, the killer. So that is how they knew that it was VR that killed Claude Snelling. After the Claude Snelling killing, this case was now on the national radar. Right. Nationwide. So many local newspapers gave the assailant the name of the Visalia Ransacker. So that is when he was properly named and given the moniker of the Visalia Ransacker. And police massively stepped up manpower in this investigation immediately. Before, it was kind of, you know, we had some more active patrols, but now they just completely pumped up all of their manpower and actually created another task force directly because of Claude Snelling's murder. Right. However, he, remember, he was a cop, so any of the tips and tricks that they were planning, he probably had access to. Exactly. His Claude Snelling's murder was on September 11th. On 11 days later, on September 22nd, so starting September 22nd to December 10th, VR hit 10 more times. Mm-hmm. So he's hit 10 more times over the course of three months. So it looks like his pattern dropped a little bit, but he's still hit right. 10 more times. Right. And I don't know if maybe he stepped back for a second and was like, maybe I'm getting too much or like getting into this too much. And then it was like, oh, maybe I liked that. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. It's it's crazy. So he's still hitting just here, there and everywhere. So 10 more times since Claude Snelling's murder. So then we get Mm -hmm. into another big instance in this case, an attempted murder. And not only is it an attempted murder, but it's an attempted murder of a police officer. There are things that lead up to this, okay? So on the evening of December 10th, 1975, Detective William McGowan was assigned to a stakeout at a home in a Visalia neighborhood. A few days before, a neighbor of the home had called Visalia Police Department with a tip that there had been prowler activity recently. And the prowler activity recently, it actually just... It it was for a while before. So going actually back to February, February 16th, there was a ransacking at a next door, at a a neighbor, at a residence. Then again in July, another woman who lived on the street interrupted a burglar. She came down from upstairs in her apartment and the man who was wearing a ski mask pushed her down and then ran outside. A couple months after that, that young woman became aware of a peeping Tom outside of her bedroom and bathroom windows. So the police advised the family to call them when shoe prints appeared outside of the home. How creepy is that? Right. And weren't the families of of all these um, people that were suspecting a peeping Tom raking outside their windows so that they could see fresh. Yes. That's actually what the police told people in the neighborhood, in the, in the city to do is rake under Mm -hmm. your windows to see if you have footprints. Like what the fuck? How horrible is that? Can you imagine that there's literally this fucking maniac on the loose to the point where police are like, well, can't really catch him. So just rake under your windows to see if he appears. Right. And just he can just jump fences and be out. And yeah, we can't catch him. People that chase him can't catch him. So December 9th, 1975, we're getting closer. The shoe prints are found. The police were called and they added this particular home to their list of areas to stake out. Because at this point, the police have been like, okay, once shoe prints start appearing, he's going to hit that house. So December 9th, shoe prints are found. The police add this to the stakeout list. So here we have the magical night of December 10th, 1975. So 6 o'clock p.m., On December 10th, Detective McGowan positioned himself in the garage of the house next door to the victims, right? The one who's getting the shoe prints, and they're pretty sure that their house is going to get burglarized. Right, because he returns over and over again to, I think, just get their their habits, right? Exactly. 
Now, his partner was staking out the residence from across the street. So all eyes were on this particular house. Also on this night, about 6.30, VR burglarized a home about a half mile south of where the police officers. So VR hits a house about half a mile away. About 8.30 p.m., two and a half hours later, Detective McGowan is sitting in a garage and he notices a shadowy figure appear. He's lying in wait. The figure is moving kind of slow and crouched by the shrubbery, and he makes it to the opening of the garage where McGowan was hiding, and he kind of peeks in, doesn't see anything, and then keeps going to the side of the garage and makes his way down to the back gate, where he can gain entrance to the backyard and then the the back door of the house. Right, and he had done this before, so he kind of knew the layout. Exactly. So this is when Detective McGowan rose up from his hiding spot in the garage and kind of silently began tailing him. So he follows VR to the back gate and sees him tampering with a lock for a few moments. And then basically trying to surprise him, he turns on his mag light, his flashlight, and shines it directly on on his face and says, police officer, hold it right there. And... What's so interesting, and this has been the talk of so many Reddit and Facebook groups and pro boards, the suspect, you know, obviously the VR, <laughs> says, yes. oh, my God. And, and then he spins around. He's like, oh, no. Oh, my God. Oh, no. And he's actually tra- speaking as a woman. The, the figure, he was wearing a stocking cap or ski mask. Dr. Uh, Detective McGowan couldn't really tell. Um, reached up and actually removed it with his right hand, and he put it in his back pocket to distract him and then he took off running so he used his momentum to propel himself up over the gate and then he landed in the backyard belonging to the house where he had hidden in the garage detective mcgowan screamed again hold it put your hands up and they basically went on kind of a like a chase right and he said that again detective mcgowan said that it sounded very homosexual because he was oh my god please don't hurt me oh my god and then he continued to scream in a very high-pitched feminine voice Apparently, Detective McGowan was over this shit, and he fired the weapon into the ground far away from the suspect to basically be a warning shot. Also to alert his his partner, who was across the street. Right, I got him. Yeah, I got, I got <laughs> um, him. He's like, here. Shit's hitting the fan. Come over here. Yeah. Well, his partner had already actually observed the chase and was on his way over there. Right after the weapon discharge, the VR ran straight for the fence bordering the next yard, and... Th- by all accounts, he was almost like superhuman. He could literally just jump over these really tall fences. It's so creepy. So when he jumped over this house, he landed squarely in the yard where his shoe prints had been observed the day before. Yeah, because he had done it so many times. He prior. got all these houses, like hide your wife and hide your kids. Well, and he he had planned escape routes. That's all he had been doing by visiting these houses over and over and over again. He knew every way to get away. Yeah, and the police officers who are, you know, unless they probably grew up on that exact street, they don't know all the nooks and crannies of all of this. Mm -mm. Well, they don't visit it every single night, you know? (laughs) So... The police officer warned him again, put your hands up, stop or I'll shoot. And he basically continued to chase him down through the shrubbery and kind of like back alley area. The VR continued to shriek, don't hurt me. Oh, my God, please don't hurt me as he was running in a zigzag position, might I add. Right. And he knew because if they were going to fire, going to be a little bit difficult if you're zigzagging. So Mm -hmm. he actually turned around stopped planted his feet feet about five feet away from detective mcgowan and then he said look my hands are up and he raised his right hand as he did this he took a gun out of his pocket with his left hand and then shot detective mcgowan so detective mcgowan fell back from the force of the impact but luckily it actually hit his flashlight and Right. It took, like, all this shrapnel went upwards into his eye, and then VR just kept running, throwing items. Like, he was still carrying shit that he had stolen from the pr- the previous night's attack, right. and he was just, like, strolling, like, the, you know, the fucking Easter bunny, just throwing stuff all over the ground. So Detective McGowan's partner shows up, you know, radios for help, and he does not continue on to get the shooter. He stops to give first aid and, and wait for an ambulance for him. Um Meanwhile, though, the homeowner, his wife, and two visitors at the Target house, right, the house that they were trying to protect to begin with, heard the gunshot. And he actually, the homeowner, looked out of his window just in time to see VR run right through his back gate. So it's, he, um, the VR turned around and actually looked at the homeowner, paused for a moment, and then kept going, which is so creepy. Like, all this shit to protect this one guy's house and... Well, and for how many people were 
on this task force, or at least like what it sounds like when reading about it now, you would think that there would have been officers outside of the neighborhood in a sense, like to to lock it mm-hmm. down before anyone else could get out. I don't know if maybe there there just wasn't enough people or it was hard to tell where he'd be going. They well after after they called it in, you know, officer down, so on and so forth, they right. called it in. And every single on duty Visalia Police Department unit was called, all off duty personnel were called, even the California Highway Patrol was called in. Over seventy officers descended onto the area and he still got away. And the fucked up part of all of this is that I saw a YouTube um, kind of walkthrough of the scene, an interview. He hid behind a tree. Like dead by daylight style, hid behind he a tree. He dead by daylight style, hid behind a big tree and kind of like um, laid down behind a tree. That's it. That's literally it. And he got away. He was right there on the scene and still somehow escaped law enforcement. Right. And I feel like, again, that nowadays, or at least in my head, I hope nowadays with like helicopters and all these crazy lights and thermal imaging, you know, (laughs) everyone has cameras in their front and backyards. Like, I think people also don't care anymore. You'd have like half that neighborhood outside with their camera phones. Oh, that too. You're, You're right. Yeah. So McGowan is at this point the first person to have face to face to face contact with VR. So he immediately Mm -hmm. that same night was with the police sketch artist and they made a composite of the assailant. The very first composite that they made was kind of cartoonish. It actually became known as the quote chubby VR, the chubby vice ransacker or the kid like like it looked like a fat child. It looked like a fat child. Exactly. Yeah. Now, Detective McGowan was not happy with that one. So he met with a sketch artist again and created what is now known as the revised VR composite to more accurately show what he remembered. Um, Unfortunately, the first one had already been made public. It shows an odd... He's very odd looking. Um, It is. It's very strange. uh, Very odd looking, overweight man, and even Detective McGowan disagreed. And that's really, truly unfortunate because the second composite, the one that he followed up with, is the most accurate composite sketch of Joseph James D'Angelo ever made at any point in this right. entire in his entire history of crimes. It looked just like him. And I know the unfortunate one is the one that went public with you know to all the news stations and all of that. But you would think the good one where he's like, yep, that's what that guy looked yeah. like. That one would have made its rounds through the police departments. Mm-hmm. And you would think that one person even jokingly would be like, hey dude, this looks like you. <laughs> But somehow he maintained working in a police department that was just literally next door, like the town next yes. door and nothing. That's so weird. So the description that Detective McGowan gave was 20 to 25 years old, 5 foot 10, 180 pounds with short blonde hair parted on the left side, a round face and soft skin features, short stubby fingers and wearing a dark colored stocking cap. Green camouflage jacket, zipped up front and elastic cuffs, dark pants, dark tennis shoes, and brown cotton gloves. This is just a side note, but in May of 1977, Detective McGowan and one of his, um, his partner actually traveled to Sacramento to attempt to convince the Sacramento law enforcement that the Visalia Ransacker and East Area Rapist were the same person, but they failed. The Sacramento Police Department did not actually care. They didn't care to look into it at that point. So Detective McGowan mm-hmm. knew, like, when East Area Rapist eventually started occurring, that series, he knew it was the same person. Right. And apparently he brought it home and talked about it there, too, because ABC7 actually has the old interview. So the first, you know, the interview from, the, I don't know if it was that night or right after, but he, are, he had the eye patch on, right? Because remember, the shrapnel hit mm-hmm. his eye. Um, but they had the McGowan interview. But then now, after D'Angelo has been caught, they also interviewed his son, mm-hmm. Brett. So right after he was arrested. Now, in the interview, Brett said he had just finished the chapter about his father and I'll be gone in the dark. And the detective knocked on his door the next day. Such sweet justice. Saying that he was caught. Yeah. Like, I was like, oh, that's that's amazing. Like, imagine reading about your father and his life's work. And then next day, they're like, you know what? We got this asshole. (laughs) So Brett also remembers the patch over his father's eye and his father explaining to him that he had been shot at. And imagine being a kid hearing that your father just got mm-hmm. shot at. And, you know, that being burned in your brain forever. 
he continued to say that it also haunted his father mm-hmm. and how badly he wanted to solve this case. Even him, he says he believes his father was the first to suspect that Vesalia Ransacker was the same as the East Area Rapist. And the connection has finally been confirmed in his family. So he ended the interview saying that it brought a lot of closure to his family and that his father is finally at peace. Growing up that way, just knowing my father got shot at, this person's still out Mm -hmm. there. This person, you know, according to my father, is doing even worse things now. And there's no one believing Mm -hmm. you guys. (laughs) It's true. Now we get to the end of the Visalia Ransacker series. So after the encounter with Detective McGowan, the Visalia Ransacker crime series just abruptly stopped. However, there Mm -hmm. are two unconfirmed instances. Now, they are listed as possible, but not confirmed. And I don't know why they're not confirmed, because Jesus fucking Christ. On January 18th, 1976, two girls noticed a man peeping in at them in their home. Once spotted, he made his way out of their backyard. The suspect... White male, early 20s, 5'11", 195, 190 pounds, round face, light-colored, short hair, light complexion. He was even wearing a camouflage jacket that was described the same way as the jacket worn by the VR on the night of Detective McGowan's shooting. Well, hey, it helped him lay down and camouflage into the He claudette He did. He was a blendette. As we say. And then October 24th of 1976, um, the victim that had been knocked down, right, that we talked about earlier in July of 1975, he freaking burglarized her house. He actually went back the following year and knocked her house and did it again. Right. And this will continue that he, you know, comes to the same places. Now, one thing after talking about McGowan, though, you know how he kind of blinded him with a flashlight? Is that where he learned, hey, flashlights are very blinding. I can use this. Also, he was a police officer, so maybe that was part of the police training, too. A woman of surprise. I don't know. Right. But, I mean, just it happening to him and seeing what an impact it was, maybe. He definitely seems to be a criminal that learns on the go and learns what works. Now, as far as evidence from the Visalia Ransacker, because this person hit so many times, he was sure to have left evidence behind, right? You would think. You would be, you would be wrong. He left footprints and fingerprints. Apparently, the police had his fingerprints but couldn't find a match. And then the police have been completely mum on anything else. He masturbated at scenes. He left semen. So you would think, right, the police would collect the samples to try to figure that out. No, because at the time, it wasn't con- because he wasn't considered a violent criminal, a rapist at that point, those samples were not kept as evidence. So they threw them away? Like they gathered them and then they just discarded them? For the them? semen, they never even took them. Interesting. Yeah. So they had nothing. Apparently, no. The only evidence at this point right after, right, for the Visalia ransacking crimes that, that law enforcement has admitted to possessing is the ballistics from the gun used to murder Claude Snelling and how it linked to a previous burglary of the VR. That's all that law enforcement, up until April 25th of 2018, that press conference announcing that he'd been arrested, police did in fact say that they have evidence linking. They won't say what it is. Mm. So it could they could be referring to the ballistics, but we don't know. Right. Well, they say we're confident that we have captured. Yes. Let's move on to post-arrest, right? We're kind of fast-forwarding. This is how Joseph James D'Angelo and his arrest in 2018 kind of ties up the Visalia ransacking series. So the district attorney from Orange County confirmed again on April 25th in the press conference that he was, in fact, the VR. They stated, out of the 102 crimes that are officially attributed to the Visalia ransacker, the Snelling murder is the only one that they can prosecute. That's horrible. Isn't it, though? So, therefore, just James D'Angelo has only been charged with one count of murder for Claude Snelling. And to your point, Amanda, yes. So, Larry Crompton, a retired lieutenant with the Contra Costa County Sheriff's Department, says that the evidence linking Joseph James D'Angelo to the Claude Snelling murder is, quote, rock solid. Again, at this press conference, they were asked about physical evidence. So the chief of police of the Visalia Police Department, Jason Salazar, told the press that the gun used to kill Snelling has never been found, but that the MO link between the Visalia ransacker and Golden State Killer cases is very strong, and that the ballistic information tying the Snelling crime to the VR series also has a strong link. He also mentioned that there is additional physical evidence that he's not willing to discuss. It's now over two years later, and they have not confirmed what that physical evidence is. 
Right. Well, they haven't gone over a lot yet. It's true. They're also, there's, uh, this case it, it has probably one of the biggest followings online, right? Mm-hmm. As far as web sleuths and stuff. And so people are speculating that maybe he has items in his home, trophies, things right. that he took from crime scenes that maybe law enforcement um, discovered in his home. Because if you saw after he was arrested, they came out with fucking truckloads of shit, like truckloads of items and things mm-hmm. from his home. So maybe they found a couple things there. Right. And some of the odd items that he took. So like you had mentioned, like family heirlooms and stuff, those aren't replaceable. You can't just go buy those. So mm-hmm. if he has something that is very old and, you know, one of a kind that he had taken, that's pretty damning, right? Uh, it's also worth noting, too, that even though in this series, we only know of Claude Snelling. Now, again, as I stated before we started this episode, this time, this particular area was a hotbed of crime, right? At the time in the 70s, in mid 70s, mm-hmm. how there were murders, other murders, other goings on, but goings on, but so far Claude Snelling is the only one that has been linked to him. There are two additional possible murders. Um, The first one being Donna Richmond and Donna Richmond was a 14 year old girl who was found dead in an orange grove and she had been strangled, beaten, sexually assaulted and stabbed to death. Now that's pretty, pretty far out of D'Angelo's MO. Oscar Clifton, a convicted sex offender was prosecuted and convicted in July of 1976 for the um, kidnapping, rape and death of, Donna Richmond. But what's so controversial about it is people, for some reason, believe that Joseph James D'Angelo could have tried to frame him. There's a whole, like, community based on this, right, online, and people who say that he had to have been framed, that Joseph James D'Angelo was very familiar with canals and so on and so forth. Who knows? It's kind of irrelevant at this point. Right. But just worth mentioning. Yeah. When you well, when you're looking at it, there is a lot of theories that there are additional victims to this that just were never properly linked. The big one, as far as for the VR t- time, is Jennifer Armour. And this actually, if you go online or Reddit or whatever and Google it every single day, even now, there's a post about Jennifer, Jennifer Armour and how um, she's possibly another victim of Joseph James D'Angelo. The last time authorities confirmed her whereabouts was on November 11th, 1974, between 7 and 7.30 p.m. on Damari Street at College Avenue. Now, Damari Street in Visalia was a street that Joseph James D'Angelo struck many times Mm -hmm. as the VR. Um, On November 25th, 13 miles away, her body was found in the Friant Kern Canal at a railroad crossing between Avenue 300 and Avenue 306 south of Woodlake. Her body was found naked with her hands bound by her bra behind her back. And that will become very, that MO will become very relevant. Mm -hmm. Uh, The autopsy report revealed the cause of death as drowning. She had been sexually assaulted. So it seems like she had been possibly tortured, sexually assaulted, and then drowned. She was last seen wearing a blue jacket, blue jeans, green suede shoes, and a necklace and a small bell. But none of those items were ever found. Uh, A detective said that a lot of evidence from the body was lost because she spent as many as nine days in the water. Sad. So sad. And yeah, who knows what else is going to come of it while they're pulling, you know, evidence out. And I, from what I had read too, some of the evidence was set to be destroyed because it had been there for so long, but a lot of, or a couple places still kept it, luckily. Yeah, it's it's just so weird how many, as we've stated, how many departments and jurisdictions and counties that this crime spree actually, and that's actually part of the reason why it it went on for so long, is that, you know, first he was in Exeter, and then he just moved right over to Visalia, and then after Visalia, he moved up to Auburn, which is like three, almost four hours north of Visalia and Exeter, and so then, you know, near Sacramento, and so then he starts committing crimes there. Well, they're in completely separate jurisdictions cities and counties so another police department another agency so he was able and at that point in 1970s they were still using rolodexes yes for information you know so it's not like it was a computer oh here sure let me just email you this file it was actual hard paper hard copies so 
What I find so interesting is he's been arrested, right? We're mm-hmm. waiting for him to go into his his trial, even preliminary hearings. We're all still waiting here. The last news that I heard is that he's asking to actually plead guilty to some some charges, not sure which ones. And they were interviewing the victims to see how they f- would feel about a plea deal. They have not said anything about evidence. They haven't confirmed what they found in his home. They haven't confirmed anything. Yeah. Yeah. So- it's just... So there's so much, but there are a lot of discussions based off of destroyed evidence, too. And mm-hmm. I'm just curious when all of that comes out, because, yeah, it was past, you know, the time frames. I mean, he, he was masturbating on scenes, right? And he was leaving semen behind, but they didn't take that as samples. No. So then we have East Area Rapist, who got raped, uh, raped upwards of 50 women, left semen samples behind and inside. What if they had taken semen samples from VR? Right, they could have linked it a lot faster. Rather than waiting until 2018 to link it. Mm-hmm. It's just, yeah, it's it's crazy. Just the system altogether, there's good, but there is a lot of bad too. And also as time and scientific advancements and law enforcement techniques, you know, also improve. So Right, right. And again, just like these same crimes, if they were to attempt to happen in today's date, just like like we kind of talked about, there's cameras everywhere. Everyone has a camera on them at all times or, you know, a, a way to record video, live stream where everyone can see it at once. There's just so many different things that have changed since since the 70s. It's very true. So the next series that we're going to cover, this was a Visalia Ransacker series. Again, just a really broad overview. There's so much in mm-hmm. this case that we didn't weren't even able to discuss and deep dive into, but just giving you kind of like the very broad overview. The next series that we will cover, release date to be determined. Hopefully <laughs> we'll get it out sooner rather than later, but there is, you know, a noodle head called Lori Vallow <laughs> who keeps us very busy. Yes. So yeah, we'll cover the East Area Rapist crimes next. Mm-hmm. Those are horrible. Absolutely terrifying. And then um, for those following along, too, we do have our Patreon episode coming out later this week as well. Uh, We still have not released what it is. It'll be a surprise. Mm -hmm. So and also for those that are following our Lori Vallow series, uh, if you do have questions, submit them by Friday the 22nd. We've posted all of our social media, too. So if you have something, get it to us so that we have some time to research. And then next week, we should be answering a lot of those questions. So look forward to that. And again, if you want to get in on our secret Patreon episodes, please visit our Patreon at patreon.com forward slash we saw the devil. We already have a Patreon episode and we do those monthly. Yep. And we have some goodies. So until then, um, did you have anything else, Amanda? No, we have a lot of stuff going on for you guys. So just keep an eye out. (laughs) Keep an eye out. So with that, until next crime.